here we go. So, please tell us about the book you will be discussing today. Could you give us a brief description of both the subject matter and the inspiration for this work? That didn't sound very natural, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. So, so obviously the book is here, Violence mm -hmm. is a Generative Force, Identity, Nationalism, and Memory in a Balkan Community. Um, the book, uh, I came to the subject in some ways almost by accident. So I was actually in the process of researching uh, how people remember uh, intercommunal violence. So the historical period I was interested in was 1945 through the 1960s in mm. the former Yugoslavia. Mm. I had done some research in Serbia, I had done some research in Croatia, and I had case studies about mm -hmm. local struggles over how to remember uh, massacres and different mm -hmm. forms of civil war type violence that had happened in, these, in local communities in each of these former Yugoslav republics. I was searching for a case on Bosnia, and I was having a lot of trouble working in the archives. Uh, a lot of the staff in the archives were new since the end of this most recent war in the 90s. Mm -hmm. uh, they were more or less full of goodwill, more or less, mm -hmm. uh, but also to some extent lacking the same level of knowledge in Serbia and Croatia simply because they were less experienced. Mm -hmm. So I had luck one day in 2006 where one of these archivists kind of got tired of my constant requests for certain certain files and just said, listen, I'm going to take you down into the basement mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to give you uh, about 15 minutes to look around yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked her, you know, why only 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. uh, and she said, because we're going to coffee in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of my, the parameters were, mm -hmm. were basically structured by the need for a coffee break. Mm -hmm. She gave me a flashlight. I started looking around uh, in shelves, not unlike these, but with a lot less light mm -hmm. uh, and a lot more dust. Mm -hmm. And I, I just stumbled across these files uh, on which were written sites of mass executions, mm -hmm. 1941 to 1945. Mm -hmm. And so in many ways, the book began when I opened these and discovered this place called Kulinbakov, which is located in northwest Bosnia. And its wider region actually straddles the border between northwest Bosnia and Croatia. In early September 1941, uh, the documents indicated that roughly 2,000 people had disappeared in 48 hours, mm -hmm. uh, had been killed by their neighbors, uh, and that there was a huge issue about whether these these individuals could be remembered as official war victims mm -hmm. to, while the communists were in power because they had in fact been killed by men who had become members of what were called the partisans mm -hmm. under communist leadership. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, the perpetrators had become part of the post-war power structure. The victims were described as Muslims. Mm -hmm. And so I instantly had this feeling that I had discovered my third case study uh, on, on these complex mm -hmm. conflicts over how to remember the war. I began researching it. It formed part of my doctoral dissertation. And right as I began to d get ready to defend the dissertation, I decided that I actually wanted to know more about how this violence had even happened in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, what were the causes? What were the dynamics? How mm -hmm. had it affected people? Mm -hmm. So the case study itself dragged me away from my interest in memory. In fact, my dissertation actually dealt only with this case of Kulinvakov. Mm -hmm. The couple hundred pages I wrote on Serbia and Croatia just went on the shelf. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then once I became an assistant professor, I decided to scrap the dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I began researching this case going all the way back to the 17th century. Mm -hmm. What were intercommunal relations like in this region? How did people come or not come to see themselves as parts of these religious and ethnic collectivities? Was there violence? If so, on, on what kind of access? Was the violence long-lasting? Was there a history of what might be called ethnic hatred uh, or not? And what eventually uh, led these, these events to take place during these 48 hours? It was between September 6th and 8th, 1941. Mm. What caused that? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so the project itself was, you know, really began in this basement. Mm -hmm. uh, it sent me in one direction, and then a few years later, I, I went further back in time, and then mm -hmm. finally came back to the present uh, mm -hmm. with, with this eventual book here. Yeah, yeah. So the book, in essence, is really about the causes and dynamics of intercommunal violence. It's mm -hmm. about this small region in Bosnia, but I've tried to write it in a way where it speaks, I hope, uh, to those with interest uh, in any type of intercommunal violence, really anywhere in the world, mm -hmm. particularly on an ethnic access. Yeah, yeah. No, I noticed that you made particular effort in, in the book. So um, the next questions I have here are about your creative process. Mm -hmm. um, and um, they, the questions here talk about describing your process in researching and writing the book, which you've already said something about. How did writing the book challenge you, which is, you know, you can talk about. Did the process differ from that of previous works? Um, has your writing changed over time? You've talked a little bit about that too. 
and is there a pattern for your creative process? Okay, let me see if I can say a few things uh, to, to all of those. I think there were six to 20 questions there, but well, let me see. Um, so, so obviously the research was, was actually extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, up until, I would, I would actually argue up until this book, we don't really have, for this part of the Balkans, a study which makes the local community the central analytical focus mm -hmm. from start to finish. Mm -hmm. um, on, you know, say, take a book like, say, Jan Gross, Neighbors, mm -hmm. The Destruction of the Jewish yeah, Community yeah. in Yebabne, yeah, Poland, yeah, yeah. you know, where, where the community is the focus, but to be honest, really just for, you know, the, the, the day or two in which, in which that violence took place. So it's something else to try and make the community the focus for centuries mm -hmm. and decades. Mm -hmm. So the, the key challenge yeah. was, can sources even be discovered, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Do you go, how can you go, it's not as if there's an archive at Kulin Vakov. Uh, in this, in the center of this region. Mm -hmm. So, the research itself, uh, it was really, it was really unknown territory, and took me into all three countries: Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia. Documents, uh, really relevant documents from this region, are in Belgrade. Some mm -hmm. are in Zagreb. Mm -hmm. Some are in Sarajevo. Mm -hmm. Some are in Banja Luka. Some are in Karlovac, which is a town in Croatia, just to the northwest. Some are in a town called Bihać in northwestern Bosnia. Mm -hmm. And so I was constantly cycling around to all of these places, uh, finding out something wasn't here, I had to go there. Something mm -hmm. wasn't there, I had to go here. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge challenge, uh, negotiating uh, this very complex network of places where all of these documents had been sent. Mm -hmm. And of course, discovering how many documents no longer exist, mm -hmm. uh, how many things were actually never recorded for this region. Mm -hmm. uh, so the archival nature of the research was uh, had a physical challenge to it, literally, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of arranging the logistics and, and traveling and negotiating my way into these archives. Most of the archivists were very helpful. Mm. Um, they probably, you know, at first, like like anyone who does this work, they think you're kind of a, you know, a CIA agent mm -hmm. or somebody mm -hmm. uh, researching violence, speaking the language fluently. But very mm -hmm. quickly, once you demonstrate, you understand some of the history. Mm -hmm. uh, the doors open, and usually, mm -hmm. uh, the experience, and from what I uh, encountered, was extremely positive. Mm -hmm. There were a few places like Bihać mm -hmm. uh, where the resistance was enormous, mm -hmm. uh, and where I went back over a period of years, mm -hmm. literally trying to fight my way into. Mm -hmm. Uh, some of these storage depots and, and archives. And so some of that resistance was of a personal nature. Some of these archivists, or I should say directors mm -hmm. of archives, uh, treat the material kind of as personal property. Ah, yes. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, some, it's political. Uh, they don't, like foreigners maybe. Mm. Uh, some, it's just a, a lack of know-how or a lack of desire to actually perform the job. But mm -hmm. overall, uh, the competency was very high. Other sources were very hard to find. Some uh, unpublished memoirs mm -hmm. that are kind of floating around in the region that people talk about. People had written about these massacres in the 1970s and 1980s, mm -hmm. had done very sensitive research, which was never published. Mm -hmm. Those materials, many of them were destroyed in the 1990s during mm -hmm. these wars. But some of the children of these people who had done this research and the researchers who were actually survivors of these massacres mm -hmm. had kept things. Mm -hmm. And so there was a process of literally working almost like a police detective mm -hmm. or a private investigator, mm -hmm. you know, calling people with the same last names in phone books, right? <laughs> uh, right. Hi, my name is Professor Brokholz. I work in Canada. I'm interested in Kulin Vakov. Is it possible your father was the one who went by this name and wrote this book? Uh, mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, yes, could I come mm -hmm. talk to you? Would it be possible to mm -hmm. uh, see some of these documents and these mm -hmm. manuscripts? So. That was difficult. And then, of course, uh, the interview process. Speaking with people about these very sensitive events that were suppressed for so many decades, mm -hmm. with this latest conflict having taken place. Mm -hmm. um, so what that meant was a lot of what people would say about the 1940s was screened through their experience of the 1990s. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them had gone through very terrible things, had lost children, lost parents. and so what they had experienced in 92 and 93 and 94 colored how they told the story mm -hmm. of 1941. Mm -hmm. And then of course there were people I talked with um, who had participated in violence in the 1990s, mm -hmm. who still had interesting things to say mm -hmm. and who were worth listening to, but it tested my capacity greatly to be empathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and also it was difficult to, to, to engage in conversation with people who had suffered such losses because uh, I actually felt in, some, in certain cases as if my search for information was hurting them, mm -hmm. to ask mm -hmm. them to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. talking with, with victims and perpetrators without trying to reify those categories too much because sometimes they mm -hmm. blend with each other, uh, that was enormously challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so the research process was unlike anything I had ever engaged with. Uh, it was not straightforward and it involved kind of the normal institutional channels. 
and and this field work component that was that was like being a researcher, but also kind of like being a, a private investigator mm -hmm. uh, on some level, if that's if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and and so the other question was, you know, my, my process of writing and, and how did how did I kind of evolve and transform as a writer during mm -hmm. this period? Um, you know, I was I, I became increasingly interested in trying to explain the causal dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, of what drove this, what, what set off this violence, what drove it, and how it transformed people. Mm -hmm. And that led me in the direction of a lot of social science literature. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually started reading far outside of my discipline uh, in a way I never had until I came to this topic. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a historian by training. Mm -hmm. uh, historical literature is what I spent most of my time reading. Mm -hmm. I've, I've always read other things, but for a number of years I, I immersed myself in political science, mm -hmm. in anthropology, in sociology, mm -hmm. in social psychology. Mm -hmm. I was probably spending most of my time reading those kinds of books, mm -hmm. um, which really heightened my sense of, of desire and I think capacity to engage in you know, what might be called question-driven research, mm -hmm. uh, trying to solve problems, which isn't exactly how most historians uh, approach uh, a certain type of subject or topic. At the same time, this story is so rich and so dramatic and so tragic that it always seemed to me it had to be told as a story, almost mm -hmm. like a movie. Mm -hmm. And so I was, I was in many ways kind of working in opposite directions. I wanted to engage in very vivid, on the ground storytelling. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I, I somehow wanted to bring this story into direct conversation with social scientists working on the dynamics of violence, mm -hmm. who write in a completely different way and right. have different conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. One of the great challenges in writing this book wa was dealing with the, the, my interest in both of these types of writing and then trying to essentially fuse them together in a way uh, in, into a new style of writing that I had actually never really adopted before. And I, I'm not sure if it came out fully successful in the book, but it was really one of the things that I, I pushed myself mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to engage in and to try and execute at the highest possible level. And of course, one of the other challenges in writing this story uh, was just the sheer, uh, the trauma of the story. Mm -hmm. The story itself is heartbreaking, it's terrifying. Uh, no, everyone looks like a victim and everyone looks like a perpetrator on some level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a story that necessarily has those clear borders between kind of, you know, the good guys and the bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there was a, there was a huge uh, challenge in trying to not take sides mm -hmm. and to just explain mm -hmm. uh, and and I think uh, I had to kind of correct that at certain points once I I kind of felt myself under the weight of some of the more tragic aspects of the story mm -hmm. um, and then of course I just I had certain periods where um, the process of writing certain chapters that were that were so connected to the actual pro processes of violence you know I was having nightmares myself uh, I could see these events in my mind because I was mm -hmm. trying so hard to reconstruct them mm -hmm. uh, as vividly and as truthfully as possible mm -hmm. um, that I, I definitely internalized them on some level and it definitely um, left me with a certain type of, a certain kind of, probably a, a certain level of trauma myself from just mm -hmm. engaging with, with writing this, this book for a number mm -hmm. of years. Mm -hmm. So I think those would be some of the main challenges that came up and, mm. and also some comments about how my writing changed and yeah. uh, over the time of working on it. Yeah, okay. So now in a difference, um, the role of reading, what does the role of reading play in your writing? So how do books, bookstores, libraries, analog research, play a role in your research and this you've already talked about this to some extent to some extent uh, um, I'll say a few more words about it mm -hmm. so uh, you know maybe like a lot of uh, academics or, or I'm always I'm always reading several books at the same time yeah, you know I have exactly. kind of a, I have kind of a, a book I read immediately after I wake up in the morning mm -hmm. to kind of get my mind focused and, and rolling <laughs> uh, I have others that I'm reading you know maybe after lunch mm -hmm. when I'm not writing uh, and maybe something I read before bed mm -hmm. uh, usually three different genres of, 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 of reading as well and while I was writing this book, I tried to actually always have uh, for my morning reading that social science literature going. Mm -hmm. Because in some ways, you know, as I'd be looking mm -hmm. at the documents or thinking about the interviews and trying to tell the story, I wanted grounding uh, in the more theoretical, yeah. question-driven aspects yeah. of, of this broader field of political mm -hmm. violence and nationalism. Mm -hmm. and, and so sometimes what I would read in the morning would allow me to interrogate the empirical evidence um, 
in that more question driven approach later in the afternoon. Yeah. And then what I would be reading in the afternoon and usually in the evening would be literature sometimes mm -hmm. um, or you know historical journalism. Mm -hmm. In other words, books that would have a tremendous narrative drive to them. Mm -hmm. And where in which authors were were engaging in just you know amazing storytelling mm -hmm. because I always wanted to have some sort of inspiring energy coming through me mm -hmm. uh, while I was writing where I had a nice example that I was engaged with mm -hmm. uh, hopefully as, as powerful as possible to kind of keep that side of my writing from being overwhelmed mm -hmm. uh, by the social science side mm -hmm. uh, or, or kind of the the more standard historical writing so mm -hmm. I used books to try and keep to try and meet that challenge that I set for myself, really. So the yeah. books, the books were crucial to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you know, walking through bookstores, uh, we don't have in, in Montreal where I live. We don't have bookstores as amazing as this. <laughs> uh, but uh, in places like Sarajevo or Belgrade or mm -hmm. Zagreb, mm -hmm. uh, there are kind of quirky, amazing bookstores that have both new books and extremely old books. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm in the region, I love searching out new and old literature. And so I derive a lot of excitement from seeing what people in the region are doing in terms mm -hmm. of trying to explain the past as well as mm -hmm. this historical moment uh, through history, through politics, through whatever it might be. So the actual act of, of, of browsing and looking and reading and talking with people in the bookstores mm -hmm. uh, is also a place that really, I think, propels me forward in my own writing. Mm -hmm. And libraries do the same thing in a much mm -hmm. more solitary, quiet way, but it's also, uh, you know, I treat them kind of like my churches, you know, like to go in <laughs> yeah. and, and, and worship on a regular basis, right? <laughs> well put, well put. Okay, next question. Do you find that your voice is influenced by what you yourself read? How do you distill your voice from those authors who inspire or influence your writing? I'm not sure I have the best answer to that question. I definitely am influenced. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I love reading political science literature because it reminds me how much I need to always focus on um, providing answers to tough questions. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, so whenever I kind of veer away from that approach in my writing, I, I'm constantly reminded of different examples, uh, different scholars whose work I really respect and who, mm -hmm. who have really electrified my own thinking. Um, and the same goes for, for the storytellers. Uh, and, and so I do think at various points, um, I can see maybe elements of these various authors writing kind of showing up on my screen as I'm drafting. <laughs> Uh, and of course, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to imitate, I want to be inspired mm -hmm. um, to find my own voice. Um, but I think because of the, because of what I tried to do in this book of, of combining social science, history and, and storytelling uh, in, in, a, in a, what I think is a fairly unique way, um, no one really provided the, like a model I could kind of mimic, right? So I, I, I don't think I was in too much danger of adopting anyone's style too much lock, stock, and barrel because I haven't, I haven't come across a book uh, that had that style that I wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, like I love Jan Gross's book, mm -hmm. Neighbors. I love a book I teach in my History of Yugoslavia class called Blood and Vengeance by Chuck Sudetic, mm -hmm. who's a journalist who used mm -hmm. to work for the New York Times. Yep. Who, who's told this much more of a story about Bosnia in the 1990s in a, in a very storytelling, but also to some extent analytical way. Um, I love the work by the political scientist Stathis Kalivas, uh, the sociologist Rogers Brubaker. Mm -hmm. um, all of these elements are important to me, but mm -hmm. these authors on their own don't combine those elements together. Mm -hmm. So, so I think you know it's it's uh, it's it's good to read uh, uh, all of these people, but I actually don't. I didn't really feel overtaken by anyone's voice. Mm -hmm. The challenge was to figure out how they fit together, mm -hmm. um, and 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 in, and in so doing, pioneer a new style, if possible. That's what I've tried to do here. But it's it's you know certainly as I'm experimenting with new approaches, you can sort of. You know, I'm reading a sentence, and it kind of sounds like like one of these scholars, a bit. and then it's you know, it's that's the process of learning how to write in a new mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's a step forward, it's a step back, it's it's seeing a bit of someone else in your writing until you really own it and make it your own with your mm -hmm. own style. Mm -hmm. So, um, working on this book for almost ten years, I think, allowed me uh, to to really gave me enough time to actually pioneer my own style. Mm -hmm. But I still think I I would I'd be interested to hear what people would say who've read the book whether they hear a distinct voice mm -hmm. or they see my voice with, with others cropping up here and there. I, I'd have to wait to hear what you know, someone like yourself or others would say. Yeah, well, I thought it was pretty distinct, actually. I was quite impressed with, That's good to hear. with your, your murder. The way you went back and forth among, well, back and forth, the way you moved among 
history, storytelling, and theoretical concerns was very impressive. Thanks. To say. Thanks. Um, okay, last question. Please name three books that you think everyone should read. <laughs> okay, this well, we, we have, just by chance, we have, yeah, have the three yeah, right here. Yeah, exactly. So, it looks uh, like one and three looks like it's, five. Well, the one is a trilogy. Oh, okay. So I, 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 kind of, I kind of cheated in a way. So uh -huh. one, it, one is actually you. three. Good for you. But That's I, how it should be. I nonetheless believe everyone should read all three of, okay. of this trilogy. So, mm -hmm. so I'll just go through them quickly. The first is uh, this Memory of Fire trilogy by Eduardo Galeano, mm -hmm. uh, a writer from Latin America, mm -hmm. uh, one of my favorites. And I distinctly remember reading this trilogy while I was an undergraduate, mm -hmm. um, uh, just at the end of my studies. And uh, a family member referred me to, to, to Galeano. And, you know, he's a, he's, he's a writer. He's, he engages in, in literary... Uh, reconstruction of historical events with mm -hmm. an imaginative component, mm -hmm. which is nonetheless based on reading of sources. Mm -hmm. But as as writers are allowed to do, and and, mm -hmm. and many do so well, with his own sense of imagining, you know, the thoughts and the feelings and mm -hmm. the emotions of people mm -hmm. in these dramatic moments. And so he tells the history of Latin America from, you know, a millennium ago up until the 20th century mm -hmm. in these moments. Mm -hmm. And the genre of the book in these kind of short paragraphs or a page or two. Uh, of these pulsating, vivid moments was a was a style of writing I'd never seen before, mm -hmm. uh, and I think you know l reading this book it just it just showed me the importance that uh, or for me at least that history has to have a pulse mm -hmm. and it has to be the kind you know you hear like beating in your ears, and I think you know Galeano's trilogy Memory of Fire is just a kind of a ridiculously successful example of that, and and one that that showed me also he's a writer that works outside of conventions. Mm -hmm. Which was something that I didn't know if I could do, but I, some, I you know, it's kind of one of those things. If I'm going to be a writer, I want to be like this guy, uh -huh. right? So the 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 second one I think uh, is a book, Ethnicity Without Groups, by yeah. Rogers Brubaker, yeah. um, sociologist, okay. sociologist at the at University of California, Los Angeles, uh, whose work I started reading when I was in graduate school, mm -hmm. uh, about 15, 16 years ago, um, questioning the the notion that kind of groups or categories called race or ethnicity mm -hmm. or nationality exists in the world and trying to reconceptualize these notions as perspectives on the world mm -hmm. uh, that crystallize, that don't crystallize, that happen quickly, uh, that may matter in certain moments. Uh, that uh, reading him completely changed how I thought about the subject of nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and for me, as a, as, a, as, a, as a student at the time and as a as a developing professor of history, history, this was kind of a watershed moment encountering his work. Uh, has stayed a very crucial theoretical anchor in my work. Uh, my book is very much inspired by reading uh, his ideas. And also, I mean, just, he's a phenomenal example of someone who without, without having the capacity to do empirical research, say, in the former Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. um, changed my capacity to do empirical research mm -hmm. uh, and, and most importantly derive significant theoretical findings from that research mm -hmm. I think in a very useful useful way not just from a scholarly perspective but also from a political perspective mm -hmm. um, so my book's going to be translated soon and I think bringing his approach my own version of his approach to that region uh, will be something useful what is it going to be translated into? Uh, into, it's going to be a version of Bosnian and Croatian, let's say. Uh, so it'll uh, be published in Latinica? It'll be published in Latinica. Iekavski? Iekavica, mm -hmm. right. So, uh, but not that kind of heavy Hrvatski jezik. It'll be, mm -hmm. it'll have some elements, but it's, it'll be a version of what might be called today the Bosnian language without... Mm -hmm. Without the Turkish? Without, without, yeah, Turkism. without it being linked too much to the, to the federal, mm -hmm. uh, to, the, mm -hmm. to the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Okay. So mm -hmm. the last book is one I just read um, this year called A Rage for Order. Uh, this is the Middle East in turmoil from Tahrir Square to ISIS by Robert Worth. I read this over the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and this is an absolutely brilliant analysis mm -hmm. and story of what's taken place in the last five years in the Middle mm -hmm. East. Mm -hmm. um, it's an area that I think anyone who wants to say, wants to understand the world today has to know something about. Mm -hmm. Worth is this guy who ha found amazing uh, people on the ground in a host of different contexts, willing to share intimate details uh, about everyday life and larger historical and political structures and processes. Mm -hmm. Puts them together not just in a narrative that's impossible to put down, but with amazing explanatory 
leverage and mm -hmm. force. Mm -hmm. And I just think, um, you know, going back to say a uh, historian like Mark Bloch, mm -hmm. who wrote about the fall of France in 1940, what Robert mm -hmm. Worth does here, which is so hard for scholars to do, is to because we're all, we always have so much time to work on our studies. You know, here I'm writing about Bosnia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not necessarily in the news today. Mm -hmm. uh, the Middle East is, but it's very difficult to actually sit down and write a book that explains what's happening now mm -hmm. uh, when, it, when it's so much in flux and in turmoil mm -hmm. um, without, you know, with the, t with the clock ticking. And so I think Worth's book is, is a tremendous inspiration to, uh, to actually sharpen our capacities to think about how we explain um, today, mm. right? And, and with an eye on, on maybe uh, a sense of, of where we're going tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I think a, all scholars can benefit from that, especially historians. And so he, I found, a real inspiration to my own work to always be thinking not just about how I'm explaining problems in the past, but what's happening right now and where my mm -hmm. research, uh, what that shows us about where we might be going tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And I think his book is just a phenomenal example of that. Great, good. I guess that's it. Huh? Thank you.